Hey everyone, welcome, welcome. I'm Deb Haygood, I'm part of the Women in the Word teaching team. <clears throat> and what a joy to be back. Isn't it great to be back first day of our fall semester? Yeah, coming together to studying God's Word with all of you. Um, nothing I like better than studying God's Word with other women, love that best. So thank you for coming, thank you for being a part of this. You know, um, first day of Bible study always kind of reminds me of the first First day of school and I thought of that as I was walking around this morning taking pictures of all your beautiful faces at your tables and I thought it's kind of like those first day of school pictures that the moms sent out of their kids and my daughter Rachel sent me two pictures this year of my grandson Dylan one he's riding his bike off to school the first day of kindergarten second he's driving off to his first day of his senior year and I teared up and then I thought wow that happened in the blink of an eye and I thought some of you you've been coming to women in the word for years and years we have studied many Bible studies together uh, and maybe that's gone by in the blink of an eye it has for me but some of you are really new to women in the word you've been coming just a few years or maybe you are here for the very first time ever and if that's the case I want to say welcome to you thank you you so much for coming and being a part of our story and maybe you're excited but maybe you're a little scared or confused because we have been giving out a lot of information and I have a story for you so my daughter-in-law Erin um, she went to the uh, orientation meeting for parents of ninth graders because my granddaughter started ninth grade high school this year so at the end of the meeting uh, questions she raises her hand and she says now will they on the first day of classes get their supply list from their teachers silence the assistant principal just kind of pauses and looks at her and then she says what supply list <laughs> so hey there's a heads up for those of you that are sending ninth graders next year there's no supply list in high school I guess they think you um, know that so she felt pretty dumb she said gosh I wish I hadn't asked that question I want you to know you can ask us any question please we want to answer your questions we want you to feel comfortable at women in the word so find somebody in leadership come ask me small group leader ask your questions we want to answer them for you and uh, I'm just going to take a minute now to maybe talk a little bit about your study questions um, that's how we study the Bible at women in the word and so you receive today a packet for this first six weeks um, and each week is three pages of questions and it's over what we're studying in first Kings and so you do that at home and I I want to say that we um, design these questions for you we write them for you they are to help us to direct us into the truth in the Bible they are to lead us in interacting with God's Word so that we are drawn into it finding insight and understanding and truth so we try to make them exciting and relevant and applicable and the more time you spend on the questions the better it is for you because that gives you more time to think about them to talk to the Lord about them and to let the Holy Spirit give you wisdom and insight but if you only have five minutes to work on your questions or maybe no time at all please come on to women in the word because we want you to be here and when you get here first thing you do go to your small group and you discuss your study questions now I know some of you are thinking uh, I will not have anything to say not gonna say anything never studied the Bible before let me assure you you will because when you start looking at your study questions pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding and he will he will and then come to your group and share your insights and your answers even if you've never studied God's Word before you may say something that'll be the best thing somebody in your group hears all day so come and share and then after your small group time there'll be a teacher who comes she studied the passage um, in depth she's the one that wrote the questions and she will give you some applications and insights and tie it all together 
And let me just add one more thing. We do not want you to be discouraged or frustrated. So if there's a question you don't get, just skip it and go on to the next. We probably wrote a bad question. So just go on. We want your study of God's word to bring you joy and a deepening relationship with the Lord because that is why we study God's word. Questions are how, but why we study God's word is to get to know God better. The Bible, these are God's words. He speaks to us through his words. He reveals himself to us. He wants us to know him because he wants to be in a relationship with us. That is incredible. The creator, God of the universe, wants to be in relationship with you and me. And it's been like that since the very beginning. In Genesis 1, we see God. He creates man and woman, Adam and Eve, and he looks at his creation and he says, very good. And then he's in relationship with them. He walks with them in the garden. And when sin enters the world, God has a plan for that. God is going to send a savior who would come and give his life to pay the penalty of our sin that we might have a forever relationship with God. He wants a relationship with us. And his plan begins uh, with his promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. He promises him descendants. He says he will create a special people um, through Abraham, and he's going to give them a special place to live, special land. That's the promised land. And that he would promise to Abraham a blessing would come from Abraham for all people, and that is Jesus. So from these people in this special land, Israel, comes Jesus, Savior for the whole world. And so from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, um, it is the uh, story of God's ongoing relationship with his people in order to redeem the world through them. This semester, we are going to study the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings. And this takes place during the time of the monarchy. That's when kings rule over Israel. And the monarchy really begins in 1 Samuel, when Saul is anointed first king of Israel. Now, God's plan was to rule Israel through the kings. They would listen to God, and they would obey him and follow him. But Saul pretty quickly stops listening to God. He doesn't obey God. Saul uh, wants to do his desires, not God's desires. He wants what he wants. So a few years into that, God tells Samuel, the prophet, I'm sort of done with Saul. And so he tells Samuel to anoint the one who has a heart for me. This is what God says to him. And that is David. David. He's the youngest of Jesse's sons, and he's young. He's fit probably around 15 at the time. And even though he's anointed um, king, it'll be about 15 more years before he takes the throne. But we read there that God is with David. God's spirit is on David from that time through his whole life. He is with David. And so we see David doing great things. He kills Goliath, the Philistine giant that is mocking God, kills him with a stone and a slingshot. We also see David um, fight in Saul's army for Israel. And everywhere David goes, he is victorious in battle to the point that um, people are singing songs about him, which makes Saul very jealous. And he wants to kill David. And so the whole rest of 1 Samuel is David on the run from Saul. And that whole time, David continues to have a heart for God. So what is a heart for God? I think we all want a heart for God. So what is that? Well, David loves God and he believes God. He believes that God is the supreme ruler over all things. He is in control over all things. God is sovereign. He also believes that God is completely righteous. God is holy and God is always merciful and God, God's will is always best. David believes all of this. This is a heart for God. So 1 Samuel closes with Saul's death and 2 Samuel opens with David finally coming to the throne. And I want to talk about a few high points um, that we see in 2 Samuel because when our study today opens in 1 Kings, David is still king. So let's talk just a minute about David. 
First thing, um, he comes to the throne and he wins the heart of the people of Israel. And it says he unites Israel. These are 12 tribes, they're all united as one Israel. And he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem because he wants to lead the people in worship. Then God makes an incredible promise to David. And I put that on your extra verse sheet. You all should have an outline and a verse sheet. And it says, 2 Samuel 7, 16. This, this is a great and important promise. God says to David, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God would establish this throne and house for David and we see God keep his promise because every king in Judah until the Babylonian captivity comes from the line of David. And then even into the New Testament with Jesus, the king of kings, he comes from the line of David. David continues to win every battle um, with the Israel army, um, but this time of triumph turns to tragedy when David sees a beautiful woman, Bathsheba, and he decides he is going to sleep with her, even though she is married to one of David's faithful soldiers, Uriah. And so when Bathsheba becomes pregnant, David gives the order to put Uriah in the front line of battle, fiercest battle, and when Uriah is killed, David marries Bathsheba. And then God sends Nathan, the prophet, we can see him today, to uh, confront David with a parable. And at the end of this parable, David realizes he has sinned against God. And so he cries out in um, sorrow and confession and repentance. And he asks God to forgive him. And God does. God doesn't leave David, but there are consequences for David's sin and they will follow David through the rest of his life. We also see in 2 Samuel um, that the palace life, his family, is always in chaos. There's always trouble and tragedy. And part of that, I think, is due to David's poor parenting skills. He loves his children, but he's just not involved. He doesn't teach them. And then one more highlight, um, and that is at the close of David's reign. It's the last chapter in uh, 2 Samuel. And David takes a census. He counts the people of Israel. And this is a sin. Now, some of us might think that doesn't really seem like a very big sin, but God had told David not to do it, maybe because of pride in David, maybe because it would be David putting his reliance on the people of Israel instead of the God of Israel. But whatever, after he does it, David knows this was a sin. And once again, he uh, cries out to the Lord in confession and repentance. Yet, there are consequences. And so a plague comes on the land and David is distraught as he sees his people dying. And so he goes back to the Lord and he calls out to the Lord for mercy. And we see in um, Samuel 24, 25, last verse in uh, 2 Samuel, it says, David built there an altar to the Lord and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded, to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. David calls out to God, asking for mercy, and we see the Lord answer his prayers and stopped the plague. So 2 Samuel ends with David, a sinner, but his heart is still turned towards God. It's not against God, it's towards God. And that brings us to 1 Kings, and our study this semester is going to be of the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings. And the God's story of love and redemption continues in 1 and 2 Kings. Now, this um, is told through, uh, this history is told through the reign of kings in Israel. 1 and 2 Kings, those books cover about 400 years. We're just going to be looking at Solomon's reign, which covers 40 years. And 1 Kings opens up with the end of David's reign and Solomon coming to the throne after David. And Solomon's reign, we're going to find that it is a time of peace and prosperity and influence. It is the golden age of Israel. Solomon is given wisdom by God to rule and um, 
judge the people of Israel fairly and wisely. He also extends the borders of Israel, even though it's a time of peace. And also he builds the temple for God, this great, beautiful building in Jerusalem for people to worship. We also, and um, that could be considered his greatest achievement. We're gonna spend a lot of time as we look at 1 Kings, uh, looking at the temple of God. Golden age of Israel. It would seem that Israel is poised to go out and receive the greatest blessings from God. Instead, Solomon's reign ends in division and decline. What happens? What happens at the end of Solomon's reign? Israel divides in two. The northern kingdom is called Israel. Southern kingdom, Judah. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will reign there. But what happens to bring this about, um, which will eventually end with the captivity? We're going to see some warning signs. We're going to see some things in Solomon's life um, that brought this about, and it's gonna be warnings for us and lessons for us that are gonna be very helpful. And I wanna emphasize that this study is very relevant for us today, and we should not be surprised by that because we learned in Romans last semester um, on your verse sheet, Romans 15, four, Paul tells us this, whatever was written in former days, that's the Old Testament, was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So we are going to see in 1 Kings instruction and encouragement that gives us hope so that we can endure. Because the themes um, in 1 Kings are very similar to those themes going on in our life. We can relate to them. One, God is in control and working through all things, even when it is difficult to see him. God is sovereign. Second, God is always faithful. We're gonna see God's faithfulness over and over again as we, um, in the next few weeks. And importantly, God calls us to be faithful to him. Like David, we need hearts that are turned towards God and God alone. Third, we're gonna see that God's word is true and trustworthy. We can trust God's word because it is true. We're gonna see God keeping his promises over and over, doing what he says that he is going to do. And there's some other themes. One is worship. Um, the question, who will you worship? Big question in um, our study, a question for us today. Who will you worship? So with that overview, let's turn now and uh, look at 1 Kings, and I'm going to read the first four verses. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. Now, King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore, his servants said to him, let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel, and they found Abishag, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. So we begin uh, with David. First Kings opens up with David. He is still king, but he is in decline. He is old and cold and frail. His health is failing. So his servants decide, we'll look for a young woman, a virgin, someone without a husband or family ties, so she's not distracted, and she can um, spend all of her time serving King David, caring for him and keeping him warm. So David's servants, they're out searching and they find the beautiful young Abishag to keep David warm. And she's called a Shunammite because she is from the town of Shunem. And that's a town in the northern part of Israel. And she comes and serves and cares for David probably most of the time, maybe all of the time. She may have never left his room. So what is her relationship with him? Well, I want to talk about that for a minute because there's different thoughts out there. Scholars have different thoughts. Some say that she was a nurse, a caregiver. She certainly seems to be that. But then others say, the other end of the spectrum, that David um, may have considered her as queen. That seems 
maybe. But the biggest and most predominant thought is that she was a concubine. Now, the people of Israel probably would for sure have thought of her as a concubine. And in those days, let me just say, a concubine is not what we kind of think. It was not a mistress, but it was a wife of secondary rank. One thing we know for sure, she remains a virgin because we read here that David did not know her and that means that he did not have sexual relations with her. Now I think she's so prominently seen in these verses because we're gonna see her again in chapter two and who she was to David plays a significant role um, in that story. I also think that uh, David's lack of sexual intimacy here also reveals just how weak he is his time is short, and his decline leaves the throne vulnerable. And we're going to see that as we go on to verse 5. Look at that with me. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. So here we see the competition for the crown begins in earnest, and we read that Adonijah just claims it with his proclamation, I will be king. Um, you know, the smile, always intrigue and trouble in the house of David. So Adonijah says, I will be king. Who is Adonijah? Well, he is David's fourth son. First, there was Amnon. You might remember Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar. And so Absalom, uh, Tamar's full brother, kills Amnon in revenge. So Amnon's dead. Second uh, is Chiliab, or sometimes he's called Daniel. He's the son of Abigail. Um, he's never mentioned again, so scholars think he probably died young. So he's gone. Third son is Absalom the one that kills Amnon. And after that, he left Israel, went to kind of hide out for three some years. He comes back. He's a little bit under house arrest. And so he decides he's going to seize the throne of his father, David. And during that revolt, um, Absalom is killed. So that leaves the fourth son now, Adonijah. He thinks he's next in line and decides that he should be king. And it says here that he arrogantly attempts to seize David's throne. He is arrogant. He's filled with pride. And we read that he exalted himself. He exalts himself. And we know pride is never good. We read that in Proverbs where it says pride goeth before a fall. We see Peter tell us in his letter, 1 Peter, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And I'm pretty sure he got that from Jesus himself because we read in Luke 14, 11, on your verse sheet, this is Jesus speaking. And he says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We know pride is not, gonna, is not good. It's not going to end well for Adonijah. Pride is something maybe that we struggle with today. I know I do. Pride is thinking more highly of myself than I should. And when I do that, the attention and the focus I'm putting on myself and not on God, he's the one that we need to exalt. So Adonijah, not good for him. We see that he gets... 50 um, men to run before all of his chariots and horses. And maybe some of you remember, that is exactly what Absalom did before his revolt. Do you remember that? Got the horses, chariots, and 50 men to run before him. And then I think this is interesting. Verse 6, once again, let's look at that. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking him a question. David, that's David, He's never disciplined or trained Adonijah. He loved him, but he wasn't involved with him. And this is, take, this is all of his children. He does that. He never really, we never see him pointing his children to God, training them up, teaching them about God, to follow him and obey him. And I think that it is a lesson for us as parents or grandparents today. Our children need training. They need boundaries, discipline, teaching about Jesus and God's word. 
along with love, 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 much love. Parenting is a big job, uh, time consuming, and we need God's wisdom. So if you're a parent or a grandparent or you know someone who is, pray for them that God's wisdom will fill them and so that they uh, train up their child well, love their child well. Adonijah did what he wanted. He got what he wanted. He was self-centered and selfish. And added to that, it says, he's very handsome. And he was born after Absalom. I think that's kind of a clue that he is getting some of his ideas from Absalom. And we're going to see that um, in this next problem for Adonijah. And that is, he seeks wrong counsel. He deviously gathers support from those that are out of favor or maybe on the edge of favor with King David. Um, it says here, um, he conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed Ananijah and helped him. So the ones that he gets to help him are those kind of out of favor. Joab, now he was um, David's right-hand man. He was the commander-in-chief of David's army. Um, he had really been David's sidekick and loyal to David all of his life, but he had also killed some people that David had said, don't kill them. One of them was Absalom. He was responsible for Absalom's death, even though David had said, do not harm Absalom. So Joab might think, hey, now's the time to take this uh, opportunity to get in favor with the next king. He's banking on Adonijah to be the next king. Same with Abiathar. He's a priest um, of David's early on, but more recently, David had been using the priest um, Zadok. And so maybe Abiathar was jealous of Zadok. Maybe he was thinking, hey, I'm falling out of favor with David, so maybe I should try to align myself with Adonijah and get in favor with him. Adonijah says that he consults them, and then he prepares a banquet, a big feast, and um, a barbecue, really. And look what it says, verse 9. Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fatted cattle by the serpent stone. I don't know if you noticed that, but I'm thinking serpent stone doesn't look good, uh, which is beside in Rogel, that's right outside of Jerusalem. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaiah, or the mighty men, or Solomon, his brother. So here he's consulted these guys, he plans this big feast, and who comes to this is very important because this banquet is really, um, people coming to it are in essence aligning themselves with Adonijah. They're saying, we support you, Adonijah, as king. And there's no turning back from this. So the guest list is very important. And it says here he invites his brothers, well, not all, and all the royal officials, but look who's not invited. Those that are not invited are just as uh, important as those that are, because it says here, Nathan the prophet, this is the main influential prophet to David, Benaiah, that's David's highest ranking soldier, the mighty men, we've heard of them, they fought alongside David way back in 1 Samuel, um, very loyal to David, and then there's Solomon, the brother of Adonijah, the one brother that Adonijah does not invite, and this really tells us of a third problem for Adonijah. His revolt is not only against King David, it's against the revealed will of God. Adonijah must have known that God's choice for the king after David was Solomon. And we know that because we read in 1 Chronicles 22, um, and I have this verse here. We're going to see this verse in the next few weeks. It's uh, important. And let me just say 1 Chronicles, it covers the same history as First and Second Samuel. And then you have 2 Chronicles, covers the history of 1 and 2 Kings. So you will see Chronicles in your study questions. And here's what it says. This is God speaking to David. 
Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. So this word from God, um, we know David told it to Bathsheba because she's going to refer to it in a minute. He would, uh, Nathan, the prophet, would have also known this. And probably the word of God had gotten around throughout the palace because it would seem that Adonijah is aware of Solomon's claim to the throne because he does not invite him to the banquet. So what happens next? Let's look at verse 11. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Agath, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice, that you may save your own life and the life of your son. Go in at once to King David and say this to him. Let's stop there just for a minute. Nathan is a prophet who serves King David, and he has a plan to counter Adonijah's plot. And I want to just say a word about prophets. Prophets are very important in the Old Testament. They're very uh, important in the book of 1 and 2 Kings. Prophets, their main role is to convey the word of the Lord to the rulers and the people. God speaks through them. Prophets speak the words of God that are given to them. These are God's words of warning to turn back to God, words of impending judgment, and also there's God's words of mercy and deliverance and uh, victory and hope. So Nathan was the most influential prophet during David's reign. And Nathan knows that God's will is for Solomon to become king. So he quickly gets to work. Nathan's plan is in harmony with God's will. As he goes to Bathsheba and first sends her in to David with these words. And this is, uh, and she's going to give him this news of Adonijah and what he's doing and what he's saying. And this is really for Bathsheba's benefit because her life and Solomon's life would be in great danger with Adonijah king. They would be a threat to his position and to the crown. He would want them killed. So Bathsheba does what Nathan says. Look at verse 15. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Now the king was very old and Abishag, the Shunammite, was attending to him. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king. And the king said, what do you desire? And she said to him, my lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. And now, behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord, the king, do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen and cattle and sheep in abundance, and he's invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army. But Solomon, your servant, he has not invited and now, my lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. Otherwise, it will come to pass when my lord, the king, sleeps with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be counted offenders. So when it says they're counted offenders, she's pointing out to David, hey, if Adonijah becomes king, you know, my life is not worth anything. He will have us killed. And then next comes in Nathan. And this was the plan. He'd said he was going to do this. He would come in after she gives David the news. And so we see that in verse 22. And verse uh, 23 tells us that he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And Na then Nathan said, my lord the king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? So Nathan comes in humbly diplomatically and it's interesting to me that the first thing Nathan does he asks David a question he asks him a question and he asks it diplomatically and respectfully and wisely he doesn't tell uh, David what to do he asks a question and so I thought about that um, a long time as I was studying this and I thought maybe there's a lesson here for me maybe when I'm serving the Lord working with believers or unbelievers or even those 
scoffers, those that are you know, opposed to God, maybe instead of just arguing my point or getting worked up over, maybe I should ask questions and listen. Maybe I need to be diplomatic and respectful and wise. Ask God for wisdom as I ask questions. That's what we see Nathan doing here. And then Nathan goes on to tell David um, same things Bathsheba said about the cattle and sheep and all of that and that people are saying long live King Adonijah but then in verse 26 he tells David a few more people who were um, left off the guest list he says um, but me your servant and Zadok the priest and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and your servant Solomon he has not been invited and then he asks David one more question, and this is really designed to spur David to action. Look at verse 27. Has this thing been brought about by my lord the king, and you have not told your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Do we just not know this is what you want, David? And as David thinks of this, here's his response. Look at verse 28. Then King David answered, call Bathsheba back into me. So she came into the king's presence and she stood before the king. And the king swore saying, as the Lord lives who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so will I do this day. So David calls in Bathsheba and it says he swore. That means um, he took an oath. And it says it twice. These words that he, he speaks are going to be very serious. And they will come to pass as surely as the Lord lives. And then I love this. David humbly acknowledges God as Lord and deliverer. We haven't seen many people talking about God to this point. We know that he's working. But David he recognizes it and he humbly acknowledges that God is at work. God has sovereignly intervened in this crisis. Even though David is king, he knows God is the one who is in control. God is sovereign. It is God who has saved David time and time again from every kind of trouble. And once again, David is saying, it is God who has intervened in this crisis. David knows God's will is best and Solomon is God's choice for king. So David will acknowledge God's will and declare Solomon king. Solomon will sit on the throne. Solomon will have the crown. And with this sworn statement, we see David's heart is still for the Lord, still turned humbly towards the Lord. David loves God and David wants what God wants. David, still a man after God's own heart. So David declares Solomon God's choice to succeed him as, as king, which assures Bathsheba's safety. And what is Bathsheba's response? Look at verse 31. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground. This shows great humility. And she paid homage to the king and said, may my Lord King David live forever. So with these words, she's really asking a blessing from God on David. And this phrase, by the way, may the king live forever. We see that throughout the Old Testament. And it is a request to God to bless the king for acting righteously. So Bathsheba is really acknowledging that this is righteous action on David's part. And then maybe we see a little desire there that David might live forever through the line of his descendants, God keeping his promise to David that David's throne would be established forever. What an interesting story this is, um, and it's all true. And all this intrigue, let me tell you, it's to be continued. So you want to come back next week and see what happens with David and Solomon and Adonijah and Nathan. Story continues. But what is relevant for you and me today? What truths, what applications can we see in this story? And there's quite a few. You may have found your own. Um, for me, one thing I saw was that we need to remember 
our sovereign God is working all things out according to his good plan. God is in control. There's nothing that we can do to change that. Now, we're not robots. We have a choice. We can either be with God and for God or we can be against God. But our sin, if we choose to be against God or the sin of our leaders or those around us, it does not cancel out God's good sovereign plans. It will not thwart or stop God's good sovereign plans. Even though we might not see God at work, we don't understand what God's plan is, remember and know God is at work. And I love it because these stories that we're gonna study this semester, they're gonna help us realize this over and over again. Second application, in all situations, difficult, sad, traumatic, emotional, um, distressing, joyful, happy, in all situations, good and bad, walk with the Lord, talk with him and trust him wholeheartedly with your whole heart. God loves you, he sees you, he hears you, he knows you and he is with you and God is our hope. So trust him with your whole heart. One of our uh, key verses for this study comes from 1 Kings 8 verse 61 and it says this, let your heart, therefore, be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments. Trust him with your whole heart. And how do we do that? Third thing, check your heart. I need to ask myself, is my heart for God? And some other questions to help us with that. Do I want what God wants? Do I believe God's will is best even when things are crashing down around me, even when my family is in distress or my friends are suffering, do I believe God's will is best? And do I seek him with my whole heart? Psalm 119 verse two tells us this, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. God wants to bless you. God loves you with an everlasting love. God is for you. He looks at you, his creation, and he says, very good. Seek him with your whole heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your love is overwhelming. We thank you and we praise you and we love you back. Lord, I pray blessings on these women. I pray for this semester, Lord, that you would open our hearts and minds to see your truth and your love for all of us. Father, I pray that you would bring us back safely next week so that we may continue to read your word and be drawn closer to you. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.